Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Ching Zhang, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office. Before we begin today, let me briefly introduce you to our speakers. First, we have Mayor Brown's senior IP partner, Gary Nas, joining us today. Gary has decades of patent litigation experience and an impressive resume that I cannot do the justice for in the final few minutes I have. We also have Brian Lacey, a senior associate with our IP group. He's a very seasoned IP litigator. We also have two founder partners joining us today. First, uh, Ms. Han Chu. He's a special IP litigator with high confidence and competitive spirit. He's a, home go he's a homegrown partner of Fonda, a top law firm in China. We'll also hear from Dr. Jiang Hu today, who specializes in distributed uh, resolution, including IP-related disputes. Before joining Fonda, Dr. Hu was a judge on a Chinese court for many years. We'd also like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Please know that when accessing Mayor Brown's webinars via our on 24 platform, we suggest avoiding the use of desktop visualization software such as Citrix to decrease disruption or quality loss. Secondly, as listed under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dialing number. For the, for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or handset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presentation. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, I invite you to submit them using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen, and we'll definitely do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Regarding the cell e credit, and I know this is important, we'll be providing an alpha numerical code during the presentation. In order to receive the cell e credit, participants must record this code on the very on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. These forms are also available to download on the right-hand side of your screen and the resource list if you need them. With that, si with that said, let's get started. Brian, up to you. Thank you, Ching, and thank you everyone for your attention today. It's a real pleasure to get to be able to speak with you. I'm going to be talking about the filing of a patent infringement case in the United States and specifically some of the initial steps that you'd want to take before deciding whether this is the right idea. You'll want to answer questions such as how do I choose which patents to assert, where should I file my case, what work should I do before filing, and I'll be going over <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be going over with you today some of the answers to those questions. My colleague, Gary Nath, will address how much can I collect in damages if I do succeed. In other words, how much might my patents be worth? Now, a bit of a, a background first. Um, I have worked on patent assertion campaigns for clients that are rather small, and rather large, campaigns that are relatively small competitor suits, and campaigns that involve many thousands of patents uh, against a, a significant chunk of the industry. So I think our team's experience in those, areas, in those areas have given us a good perspective to be able to share some advice with all of you today. So let's get into things. When you're choosing which patents to assert, it's important to have a high level understanding of what your goals are. That includes asking questions about who my targets are, um, whether you're going after specific competitors or broad chunks of the industry, the strategies are going to be a little bit different. So having a clear answer for what it is you're trying to do is going to be helpful at the outset. You also want to think about what your goals are. This is going to be a driver of settlement, of course, but it's also going to drive the case strategies that you may have in the initial phases. A case where you're trying to increase your market share or uh, keep competitors out of the market for a make or break product for your company are going to look a lot different than a case where you're maybe trying to monetize your patents and trying to generate licensing revenue. So having those goals in mind initially is an important step as well. You also want to think about how much it's going to cost. Yes, it's true. The rumors are true. Lawyers do charge for their services. 
And fortunately, there are a lot of options today for uh, handling that beyond the traditional billable hour and uh, uh, fixed fees that uh, many law firms, including Mayor Brown, offer. There are also contingency fee arrangements where the law firm would not bill for the time, but would share in a portion of any revenues that are gained. There are also increasingly popular the use of third-party funders. This works a bit like a contingency fee case where the third party funder would share in the profits obtained from any settlement revenues, and that third party funder would pay the law firm directly so that you as the client wouldn't need to. So having, a, having in mind how uh, to finance these campaigns uh, is a good first step as well. Now, I could talk for several hours, I think, about just the process of selecting which patents to assert, um, but I'd like to go over, I don't have that time today, obviously, I'd like to go over with you just some of the considerations that you'll want to have uh, for this question. Um, the way that we like to do things is to look at the portfolio of patents as a whole and break things down into several categories. You'll want to look at the likelihood of infringement, in other words, how good of an infringement read might the patent be on uh, the market or a particular competitor. You want to also look at how likely the claims are to survive a validity challenge because in every patent case I've been involved in, the accused infringer will always at some point argue that the patent's not valid. So you'll want to have a sense for how likely you are to prevail on that as well. You want to look at the remaining life of the patent, which uh, will be relevant to how much in damages you, you might have. That's something my colleague, Mr. Nath, is going to cover in more detail. And you also want to look at how well written the patent is. Is there a good specification? Is there a clean prosecution history? Are there statements that are made in either that may affect the value of the patent or may affect its scope in some way? And what we like to do is have a, an Excel spreadsheet or, or something of that nature where we rank each of these categories from one to four, four being the best and, and one being not so good. And that's a really good way to have a clear picture when you're looking at a large portfolio of, say, a few thousand patents to see which ones stand out from among the rest and deserve a little bit more careful consideration. I want to say a bit more about the balancing act that's going to need to be done between the breadth of a claim. A claim that's broad is obviously going to give you a better infringement read, but if the claim is too broad, you may have issues with validity. It may run into or uh, encompass some of what's already been done and cause validity issues. One example is the claim here shown on this slide. It's uh, Claim 16 of a patent that uh, our firm dealt with a number of years ago. And it's a relatively straightforward claim for a digital camera device. And you may look at this and think that, well, it looks like it's, it's probably going to be pretty good on validity because there are a lot of limitations there. But when you drill down and look at things, such as the first limitation of photoresponsive elements or the second one, a charge storage element, you'll see that these are really just talking about components like a photodiode, which is obviously well known and will be in any digital camera, and in a, a component like a capacitor that's relatively common as well. And so you really can't just look at a claim and say, hey, that looks rather long, we're probably in good shape here. You really need to scrutinize and carefully study the language to make these determinations about scope and breadth. I'd also like to quickly mention <clears throat> where uh, one should file a patent infringement case. In the United States, the choices are relatively simple. You can file in the United States District Court, or you can file at the United States International Trade Commission, or the ITC. Uh, state courts are not available for patent infringement cases in the United States because the federal system has exclusive jurisdiction over any questions of patent infringement. So let me go into a little bit more detail about each of these two options. Again, filing a patent case at the ITC is something that uh, we could talk for an hour or more about. In fact, uh, we've given presentations on this in the past. 
but I do want to highlight some of the key points here. Benefits to ITC cases is that you have a very fast resolution. Oftentimes, a final decision is made in about 16 months uh, after the case starts, which is almost unheard of in a district court case. So speed is a big benefit. You have very expansive discovery in ITC cases, uh, much more than you would typically get in a district court case. And that could be a good way to create some leverage on the other side to push toward a settlement. <clears throat> you can also accuse many unrelated parties in the same case in an ITC investigation. That's not something that you can do anymore in district court in the US. And finally, a benefit to ITC cases is that the exclusion orders you get, essentially injunctions, can be a very powerful remedy and a very uh, good bit of leverage uh, for settlement. Some drawbacks to ITC cases are that you need to show that there's a domestic industry for the asserted patents. There are some additional hoops to jump through there. You can't just have the patent. You need to show that you're actually spending money in the United States uh, to further that patent, either by investing in research and development related to the patent, producing products that are practicing the patent, or even having a licensing campaign uh, that you're spending money on as well for those patents. There's also an importation requirement at the ITC. The infringing articles have to be imported from outside the country into the US. There's no monetary damages available at the ITC. Uh, but like I said, the, the exclusion orders can be a very powerful remedy. There's also no preclusive effect at the ITC. What this means is that if I get a good decision at the ITC um, that the patent is valid and the patent is infringed, I may want to try to argue the same thing in district court. I'll have to make my proof all over again. The district court is not just going to take the ITC's decision and, and rubber stamp it, so to speak. It works both ways, though. If I get an unfavorable decision at the ITC, I can essentially have a, a new bite at the apple in district court. District court cases uh, are sort of the norm. You get monetary damages for infringement, unlike the ITC, and there's no need to prove a domestic industry. You also have a right to a jury trial at district court. An ITC case is going to be heard before an administrative law judge. There's no jury involved. Now, this can be a double-edged sword because jury trials have a lot of uncertainty to them. Um, that can be both a good thing and a bad thing, but it's certainly something to consider. District court's cases uh, can also be a bit slow. Typically, they take three years or more after filing. It depends on which district you're in. And you're limited to which districts you can file in by the law of venue in the United States. A quick word on that. It used to be prior to 2017 that in the United States, you could file a patent infringement case just about anywhere in the country. Uh, that all changed in 2017 with a Supreme Court case that many of you may have heard of called TC Heartland. And now the law is that you need to sue a uh, defendant for patent infringement in the place where that defendant resides or where there's a regular and established place of business. So uh, things like company stores, company headquarters, uh, in some instances, even places where there may be a call center or a service center can all be places of uh, regular and established places of business. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the work one should do before filing a patent case in the US. And there are three real steps that you want to have in this process. First, you want to choose which pool of patents you're going to assert. You want to draft infringement claim charts that really put together the claims with the accused products to make sure that everything tracks. And also you want to do some searching for prior art. Choosing a pool of patents, again, I mentioned this briefly earlier, you want to rank by strength in each of the four categories we mentioned and discuss the pros and cons of each as a group with your US counsel. Once you've chosen which patents to assert, you'll want to draft infringement claim charts for each patent, you'd like to pick at least one representative claim and at least one representative product to make sure that your infringement allegations are solid. And you want to search for publicly available evidence to do this. Uh, good categories are product manuals, 
news articles about the products, uh, the company's own websites, and marketing materials are all really good sources of information about how the products work and allow you to have some evidence initially about infringement. Of course, buying samples of the accused products is very helpful as well. If this is something relatively small and readily available, like say a cell phone, it's easy to do. But if the accused product is a car, it may be a little bit harder to come by and do that analysis. But where possible, it's always good to have samples of the products to test as you see fit. Finally, before filing, it's recommended that you work with counsel to search for prior art. There are search firms that are available for this that will do the searching for a law firm. Uh, there's also internal, there are many firms like Mayor Brown will do this work internally. Um, when you're doing this, a couple of quick tips would be to make sure that you're searching for specific companies' patents, like your competitors, as well as using broad search terms. And you don't want to forget to look for prior art products as well. Uh, it's also, uh, it's something that a lot of people forget to do. Just do a, a quick internet search to see what's been done before, uh, what products were like this before, uh, before you file your complaint. So that's it. Again, we could talk for a long time about each of these points, but these are kind of the liability considerations that we recommend uh, you undertake before filing a case. And now my colleague Gary Nath will talk about the really interesting stuff, which is how much might my patents be worth? All right, thank, thank you very much, Brian. It, it, it's all interesting. And uh, good evening to everybody in China. Uh, good morning uh, to those in the United States. Good afternoon to those in Europe. Um, my name is Gary Nath. Again, I'm a partner in Mayor Brown in, in Washington, D.C., and it, it's my great um, honor to have a chance to talk to you about uh, patent damages today. Um, I, I've been representing Chinese companies for um, 25 years now. Um, back in 1995, I represented the first uh, Chinese company to win a patent case at the ITC, and uh, in 1998, I represented uh, the first Chinese company to go to trial in a patent case in the United States and, and win. And I've had the great pleasure of, of representing Chinese case Chinese companies in over 20 cases at the ITC, about a similar number in district court. Um, Brian and I um, uh, uh, were able to win two jury trials in recent years, uh, representing Chinese companies, one in Baltimore and one in Houston, and um, you know it's, it's been a real pleasure to represent uh, companies in China over the years and have a chance to see the, the country grow, the companies develop, and uh, see the tremendous changes that have taken place. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, damages in patent cases, and even though my segment comes after Brian's, um, this is something that you should consider from the very beginning of your, your planning process. Um, you should be thinking about, um, if I'm able to win my case, um, how much can I collect in damages? What will the case be worth? And, and that will factor into whether you bring the litigation, uh, whether it's worth the expense of, of filing a lawsuit. Um, and, and also, from the very beginning of the case, you should be looking at how you can develop your case for damages. Often, um, companies in litigation, whether they're on the plaintiff's side or the defendant's side, wait till the very end to start thinking about damages. And, and that can be a mistake. You should be gathering evidence from the beginning of the case and thinking about how to, to best position um, your case. Um, so um, the, by statute in the United States, um, if successful, patent owners can receive damages adequate to compensate for the infringement, but in no less than a reasonable royalty, which means a reasonable royalty really sets the floor for the amount of damages. But you can get other types of damages, such as lost profits, or in some cases, um, which we'll see in a few minutes, you may be able to increase the damages by up to three times. And in exceptional cases, you can also get attorney seats. Uh, the graph on this slide um, illustrates uh, the total number of uh, patent cases over the last seven years and, and the number of cases in which uh, reasonable royalty damages were awarded versus lost profits um, and enhanced damages. And, 
as you can see, um, out of 230 cases, there were reasonable royalties in 184 cases, lost profits in 59 cases, and increased damages in, in 60 of those cases. Of course, there's some overlap. Sometimes you can get more than one of those types of damages. Uh, but reasonable royalty tends to be the, the predominant type of damages that can be recovered. But they're all uh, very important in thinking about how much your case is worth and how much your patent is worth. So as I said, there are the types of damages really fall into three categories, lost profits, reasonable royalties, and enhanced damages. And what you do not uh, find in patent cases in the United States are the defendant's profits as a measure of damages. Now, we'll see throughout this presentation, and I think you'll learn much more you know, from my colleagues afterwards, there's some important differences between how damages are calculated in the United States and, and how they're calculated uh, in Chinese patent lit litigation. So that, that's something that you're going to want to consider if you're thinking about, should I bring my case in the United States? Should I bring my case in China? Where can I get the most damages, et, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the basic types of damages, lost profits, reasonable royalty, and enhanced damages. And I'm gonna be talking about each one briefly um, in the next few minutes. So first of all, lost profits. So lost profits are basically um, if the infringer uh, had not infringed the patent, um, what uh, pro additional profits could the patent owner have made? Or put differently, what are the lost profits that have resulted from the, uh, the infringement? And the factors that the courts look at, um, this is a very standard test, is number one, what is the demand for the patented product? Is it a, a product that's in great demand. Number two, um, are there acceptable non-infringing alternatives? In other words, is it easy for someone to um, adopt a different technology to get around the patent? Um, or are, are there basically no um, acceptable non-infringing alternatives out there on the market? Um, does the patent owner have the manufacturing and marketing capability to exploit the demand? Because you'll have to prove that um, if uh, the infringer had not been infringing, the patent owner would have been able to make those sales, would have had the capacity to make those sales. And, and then most importantly, what is the amount of profit the patent owner would have made but for the infringement? In other words, if the infringer had not been there, what additional profits could the patent owner have made? And, and it could be elements of lost sales, that the patent owner would have made additional sales, or it could be other types of damages, such as lost market share or, or price erosion. The, the patent owner may able, be able to argue that uh, the uh, infringer has depressed uh, the price of the market, uh, that that forced the patent owner to sell its products at a lower price, and that but for the infringement, the patent owner would have been selling more products at a higher price, and that all of that should be considered in terms of lost profits. So what you'll, you'll find lost profits um, most typically argued in a competitor to competitor case. In other words, two companies that are competing in the same market with similar products and similar customers. And the patent owner is saying if the uh, infringer hadn't been in the market, we would have made additional profits. So that's lost profits. Um, reasonable royalty damages, as I said, is, is something that um, you get as a floor. In other words, you always get, um, if you can prove your case, um, you always get at least reasonable royalty damages. Lost profits would be uh, a, a, an, an alternative if you can prove the factors that I just described. But a reasonable royalty basically looks at this. Um, it, it looks at two companies that are uh, in a hypothetical negotiation uh, that takes place just before the first instance of infringement. Um, the uh, participants are discussing a non-exclusive license. In other words, um, what would the uh, infringer have been willing to take as a license? And it assumes that the patent is valid and infringed. So for purposes of any damages analysis, you always assume liability. You assume a patent is valid and infringed. And the hypothetical negotiation basically says if, if those two companies had been sitting at a bargaining table before the infringement 
and discussing a potential license, what license would they have agreed to? Uh, and there's a number of factors that the courts look at. They're called the Georgia Pacific factors. That comes from a case that was decided many years ago. And it's a number of factors that the experts and the courts and, and ultimately the jury, it goes to a jury trial, will consider in terms of um, what those parties would have agreed to in this hypothetical negotiation. So that's how a reasonable royalty works. Uh, reasonable royalties um, are often less than lost profits, but not always. Uh, sometimes reasonable royalties can be very substantial depending on uh, the proof. And, and there's a lot of room for creative argument. There's a lot of factors and a lot of arguments that, that can be made to support this type of theory. Finally, in certain cases, you can get um, enhanced damages. And enhanced damages are available um, only if there's egregious behavior. In other words, if there's deliberate infringement, willful infringement, bad faith shown by the infringer, uh, flagrant disregard of the patent. And um, if there is uh, that type of behavior, then the courts have broad discretion to increase the amount of damages up to three times. And there, there's a recent case that was just decided um, uh, last week. Uh, this was a case um, against Cisco uh, brought, brought by a small company, Centripetal Networks. Uh, they brought the case in U.S. District Court in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, it went to a jury trial before a judge, or I'm sorry, a bench trial before a judge um, in the Eastern District of Virginia. The bench trial took 22 days. Uh, there were five patents asserted. Uh, the um, plaintiff won on four of those patents. And at the end of the case, uh, the judge uh, awarded damages of $755 million, but then increased that amount by two and a half times because he found that this was an egregious case of willful misconduct. There was evidence that Cisco and uh, the plaintiff had met before uh, the infringement took place. Uh, that Cisco uh, then copied the defendant's product and, and sold it on the market, so they were aware of the patent. Uh, they copied the product, um, and the court found that this was intentional, bad faith, willful misconduct, and increased the amount of damages to the point where the total amount of damages were $1.9 billion, one of the largest patent uh, damages awards ever in the United States. So uh, there can be, uh, you know, very significant consequences if there's a finding of uh, willful or bad faith conduct. So how much, what kind of information can you get to support um, your damages case? So in the United States, um, th there is a process uh, of exchanging information before cases go to trial. It's called discovery, and it provides many, many opportunities to get information, either through uh, exchanging written questions called interrogatories, or, or more importantly, requesting documents from the other side. And, and unlike China, where the availability of uh, documents is, is more limited, in the United States, it's, it's pretty broad. And you can request um, all sorts of information during the discovery process, including sales and cost data, sales projections, product pricing documents, financial uh, documents, profit and loss statements, business plans, market research information, um, information on prior licenses and negotiations, um, all sorts of information that you can request to support um, a damages case. And, and companies will um, gather this information, they will uh, ask the other side for it, and then they will build their case based on the information that they're able to provide. So at, at the end of the discovery period, you will have very extensive information about the defendant's sales, uh, possibly their profits, um, and other information that can support your damages case. So what do you do with all of this information? This is rather complicated. As I've described it, um, you've got lost profits, you've got but-for scenarios, you have reasonable royalties. Um, Typically, you need an expert, um, and you need a damages or a financial expert to put this information together uh, to um, generate a report and then to support um, your damages case. And it, it would be almost impossible 
uh, to litigate um, a damages case as a plaintiff without having some expert testimony to support um, your position, um, unless the case is really extraordinarily simple. But most of these cases are, are relatively complex in terms of the analysis. So just as, as you need a technical expert to support your infringement uh, and your validity positions, um, you'll also need a, an, an economist or a financial expert. And they can testify about the, the market, uh, market share, demand for the patented product, um, the spot for scenario, in other words, if the infringer had not been in the market, how could, what kind of profits would the uh, plaintiff have, have made? And the, the expert will also go through all 15 Georgia Pacific factors and, and describe in this hypothetical negotiation what they believe the parties would have agreed to in terms of a, a reasonable royalty. Uh, so those are all very important. The, the, the expert's an, an important part of of the case, and it's a good idea if, if your budget allows it, and uh, if you can do it, to get the expert involved from the very beginning. In other words, don't wait till uh, the end of fact discovery to bring your expert in and then start doing the analysis. Um, get the expert involved from the beginning in helping to map out what kind of information you want to get from the other side, whether the information you're getting is sufficient for them to make their uh, damages analysis, and maybe even get them involved uh, when you're very when you're planning the case before you even file the lawsuit to assess what are the potential damages, what will they argue uh, in terms of damages, um, what is the case worth. That can be very helpful information as you're deciding um, whether to bring a case and where to bring the case. Okay, so um, again, it's been my pleasure to. Um, uh, talk to you about uh, damages in the United States. Now I will hand it over to Hans Scher, who will talk about uh, patent infringement cases in China. Thank you, Gary. So let's not next turn to the Chinese um, portion of today's presentation. So we'll first from uh, hearing from Hans Scher, and Mr. Scher is going to talk about the interesting subject of how to prepare an infringement case in China. And also next, followed by uh, Dr. Zhang Hu and Mr. Hu, Dr. Hu is going to talk about damage determination in China. Up to you, Hans. Oh, sure. Thank you, Jane, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for all your time to take part in today's uh, joint webinar. It's also my great, great pleasure to be invited to uh, join in this discussion. Uh, so that I can share with you some of my observation about the enforcement of patent rights through court litigation in China. Um, my presentation today was about the preparatory work that a patentee uh, needs to pay attention to before initiating a patent litigation in China. Uh, what is quite interesting to me is I just find that what Gary has mentioned as for the preparation or consideration before initiating a lawsuit in the U.S. Uh, can also largely be applicable to um, the, the preparatory work in China. So I just want to probably uh, focus on some specific features of the Chinese legal system so as to uh, share with you uh, something which is more of the Chinese characteristics that you need to pay attention to if you are going to file a lawsuit for patent infringement here. Um, and on this PPT slide, as you may note, uh, my topics today will include all those parts, uh, which you can regard as a very brief checklist uh, for to uh, review and go over uh, before filing the lawsuits. So uh, just as a first step, I will uh, share with my um, comments uh, about how to identify the plaintiffs in, in the lawsuit, as that is the, uh, usually the first step for any patentee to decide uh, before uh, carrying out any legal action. Um, so under the Chinese law, uh, it is noteworthy that not only the patentees, uh, but also uh, the interested parties may initiate the patent infringement. And according to the law, the interested parties generally mean uh, the licensees, which have been duly authorized uh, by the patentee or the licensor to use the patent as well as to 
initiate the judicial uh, proceedings uh, in the Chinese court uh, for the enforcement of the patent rights. So uh, for many uh, companies, for many multinational corporations, uh, which are usually the patent, uh, the patent holders, uh, they are usually facing up with one option, uh, that is whether they should file the lawsuit solely in the name of the foreign patentee, or whether the lawsuit should be jointly filed uh, by the foreign patentee, as well as the Chinese entities, uh, be it a uh, joint venture or a wholly foreign owned enterprise, which is usually the uh, license fee uh, for use of the patent in China. So on this PPT, uh, as you may note, I have listed a few factors to be considered in such circumstances. Um, for example, the patentee um, need to pay attention to that um, whether the case is a foreign related or an entirely domestic case will have an impact on uh, how long the case can be handled. Uh, basically, according to the Chinese law, uh, for an entirely domestic case, um, the case proceeding is subject to a stricter time limit. Uh, as the court is supposed to uh, conclude the entire case proceeding within a certain time limitation. But for a foreign related case, um, the, um, actually there is no such statutory time limitation. Uh, that means uh, the court will have a freer hand uh, to extend the proceeding as necessary uh, to complete any case with a foreign related element. And whether if the patent, uh, if the plaintiff is a foreign patentee or just a Chinese entity, uh, will of course decide whether the case has a foreign related element. And the calculation of damages should also be a factor that can be taken into consideration. As my fellow partner, uh, Dr. Zhang Tu, will further talk about the calculation, the ways of calculation of damages in patent cases, as you may note. Uh, there, are quite, there are quite a few uh, approaches for the calculation of damages under the Chinese law, and one of them is to uh, calculate the damages based on uh, the multiple times of a, a royalty fees for uh, utilization of the patent. So, um, in such circumstances, we need to uh, consider uh, whether there is such evidence for the a license of the patent and uh, really Hi, sorry, I was just uh, lost the connection. Uh, I'm just redialing in. Uh, so to complete my uh, first issue, uh, the availability of the legal representative as well as the number of example, according to the Chinese law, each plaintiff can only hire up to two uh, representative attorneys in a litigation proceeding. So, for example, if you will have the patentee and the Chinese licensee to jointly file the lawsuit, uh, generally speaking, you may have the possibility to hire more than two attorneys to represent you before the Chinese court. So that could also be one of the issues uh, that you need to consider in identifying plaintiffs. And in this PPT slide, as you may know, I also like to give you some takeaway advice that is uh, as for a licensee to file the patent infringement lawsuit in the licensee has to be the licensee has to be a uh, party that has been uh, duly authorized uh, by the licensor, namely the patentee, to uh, use the patent. That means the licensee shall have the substantive right to be a qualified plaintiff under the Chinese law. If the licensee is only granted a, for example, a permission, um, or in a very simple way, uh, by the a patentee, uh, the Chinese court will not regard the licensee as a competent co-plaintiff. Uh, the key issue, as you may note in the takeaway advice, is that the licensee must have a substantive right to use the patent.
And the second step that a patentee should consider is how to determine the defendant in the lawsuit. So generally speaking, that's a comparison of the different strategies between whether you sue just a sole defendant or whether you will find some other co-defendants. Uh, and as you note from uh, my presentation slides here, uh, the parties that may be joined under the Chinese law as co-defendants include the manufacturer of the uh, accused infringement product, the seller of it, the advertiser, uh, the e-commerce platform where the product is sold, uh, the trade show organizer, uh, uh, and even in certain circumstances, the sole shareholder or actual controller of a corporate defendant. So under the Chinese law, we also have the uh, concept of piercing the veil of a corporate. Uh, that means if the patentee can uh, collect and present evidence to show uh, that the corporate defendant is controlled by a uh, very a uh, strong controller that has mingled his own assets with the assets of the corporate, or if the sole shareholder or actual controller of the corporate defendant has also been actively involved or engaged in the infringement, uh, the plaintiff can also sue uh, the corporate defendant as well as the individual defendant who is the sole shareholder or the actual controller as co-defendant. Um, but as you may note from my takeaway advice here, uh, my uh, point of view is that it's not always necessary or advisable to sue more than one defendant in the infringement lawsuit. Uh, that really depends on the case scenarios. And as you may appreciate, sometimes it is more advisable to sue just a sole defendant that may not vigorously defend itself. That means the patentee can strategically uh, pick up a weakest point in the chain of infringement and sue the defendants uh, which may not have the capacity or sophistication to uh, defend in the infringement lawsuit. And once you, as the patentee, win over the lawsuit, you can just use the winning judgment as the springboard for any uh, additional actions against the other infringers that may have involved in the infringement activities. So um, the strategy of determining the defendants really depends on uh, the case scenarios. It does, not mean, it does not mean that it's always necessarily advisable to uh, pick up co-defendants and sue more than one defendant. Um, and as I uh, put up in uh, this slide, as you may note, uh, I, I've already mentioned the factor uh, of the sophistication of defendants. And also we have other factors that shall be taken into account in determining defendants. For example, uh, the patentee shall uh, consider the financial capacity of those defendants to decide uh, which party or which parties should be sued in, in the legal battle so as to ensure a smoother enforcement of the judgment in the future. Um, and the forum shopping is also a important feature uh, as the defendant, I, I mean the domicile of the defendant also determines where the patentee can initiate the lawsuit. Uh, the general principle under the Chinese law is that the patent litigation shall be dealt with by the civil court where the defendant is located or where the infringement activities take place. So as you may note, the domicile of the defendant is a primary jurisdictional connection point where the plaintiff can file the lawsuit. And as I uh, have marked on this Chinese map on the right side of the slide, uh, in China we have already uh, built up the three IP-specific courts in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. So those courts are generally regarded as quite um, sophisticated and uh, uh, patentee-friendly courts, courts, courts in China. But, but besides those IP courts, uh, we also think that courts in 
uh, those cities like Nanjing, Shenzhen, uh, Hangzhou, Suzhou, and Ningbo, uh, which are all in the uh, coast area or the first tier cities of China, uh, are also somehow reliable. So uh, the defendant actually uh, is closely related where you can find the lawsuit. So that's something you must take into consideration. And of course, you may also have some other uh, political culture or legal factors that you would like to consider. For example, uh, you may note that uh, you probably don't want to sue some post boys in a certain area if the defendant is a enterprise which has a large say in the local economy, uh, probably you like to file a lawsuit to some foreign shopping tactics uh, in the court, which is out of the home turf of such a defendant. And the most common way uh, for the foreign shopping in China is to uh, file a lawsuit against the two co-defendants. One is the manufacturer, and the other would be the seller of the product. As I just mentioned, the lawsuit can be filed at the place where the defendant is located, and that means where any of the defendants is located. So if the manufacturer is a uh, very strong company in Shanghai, probably you will try to find a seller of the infringing product in Beijing and then find the lawsuit in Beijing together against those two co-defendants. Um, and once you determine all the parties to a infringed lawsuit, the next step for a patentee, um, especially for a foreign patentee to do, is to prepare the procedure documents so that a attorney in China can be duly engaged to file the lawsuit on behalf of the foreign patentee. And I just listed here the common procedure documents that a foreign entity would have to prepare for uh, not only for filing a uh, patent infringement lawsuit, but actually a filing for, for filing almost every uh, civil lawsuit here in China. Uh, the first thing is the uh, certificate of good standing, especially for those companies located in the States, which is to be issued by the state secretary, which is a company registry um, where the U.S. company is registered. Uh, the purpose of such a document is to prove that uh, the company as the patentee or the plaintiff is duly registered in the United States and has been legally existing up to the date when the lawsuit is going to be filed in China. And the second procedure document would be the power of attorney. Um, it's a simple document just to ensure that the Chinese attorneys can be duly engaged to uh, deal with the lawsuit on behalf of the foreign entity. And the third document may sound a little bit strange to um, foreign entities, especially uh, for those corporations registered in the United States. That's the certificate of legal representative. Uh, the legal representative is quite a unique legal concept under the Chinese law. Um, that's because according to the Chinese law, each corporate would have to register a person, uh, namely that person, he or she, would be the sole uh, legal representative uh, of the uh, company that can uh, do almost everything on behalf of the company, including, of course, uh, the power and the right to initiate the lawsuit. Um, but for the U.S. company, uh, according to my understanding, the U.S. company, Euro, does not have a single person which is registered to represent the company. Uh, but still, the Chinese court, following the same procedure law, following the same rules, they will require a foreign company, including a US, U.S. company, to provide such a procedure document. So this procedure document is closely related to the fourth one, which is the board resolution. Um, so... Uh, for a U.S. company, usually the Chinese court would expect its board to issue a resolution so as to indicate which director or other corporate officer, for example, the general counsel or the corporate secretary of the uh, U.S. corporation, will be the authorized or the uh, legal representative of our corporation in, in the litigation. So 
those two legal documents are usually highly related, and uh, uh, those are uh, the common procedure documents that a foreign entity need to prepare uh, so that they can engage a Chinese attorney and also present themselves to a Chinese court for initiating the infringement lawsuit. And as you may note from the takeaway advice here, uh, because of the foreign exchange control regulation of China, it is usually advisable for the foreign entity to specify just in the power attorney uh, so that the Chinese lawyers will have the authorization to prepay the litigation fees on behalf of the foreign entity and also take the funds um, once the lawsuit is concluded. According to the Chinese law, uh, the patentee as a plaintiff shall prepay uh, the litigation fees to a Chinese court, which is calculated in proportion to the claimed amount. Um, but once the patentee wins over the case, um, as I just mentioned, that's just a prepayment. So once the patentee wins over the case, the Chinese court will just refund the patentee uh, the litigation fees it has paid. But because of the foreign exchange control, it's not so easy for a foreign entity to pay the money out of China or receive the refund and get it out of China. So uh, as I just mentioned, it's advisable to specify that the Chinese attorney can um, prepay the money on behalf of the foreign entity and also take the refunds once the case is concluded. And the next step is uh, for, uh, that the patentee has to do before filing the lawsuit is for the evidence collection. And I have to point out that uh, under the Chinese law, we don't have the uh, mechanism equivalent to discovery. Um, so the plaintiffs, as you may imagine, would have to take um, quite extensive investigation work, which is front-ended, uh, before initiating the, any lawsuit, any infringed lawsuit. So the plaintiff will have to resort to some common ways uh, to collect the evidence of the infringing activities. Uh, for example, um, the plaintiff will have to use a notary public to uh, notarize the sample purchase of the infringing products. And uh, in such notarized sample purchase, usually uh, the plaintiff would have to uh, arrange a disguised on-site visit and a disguised um, uh, purchase by placing an order um, pretending to be a potential customer of the infringing uh, products. And the plaintiff also to preserve the defendant's website as well as its social media accounts uh, to show uh, the offer to sell and other infringing activities of the defendants. And if the defendants put the products to a trade show, uh, the plaintiff would also have to engage a notary public to notarize the uh, trade show as well as to uh, preserve the evidence. Uh, of course, uh, as the last resort, the defendant, uh, the plaintiff, uh, sorry, not the defendant, the plaintiff can also uh, apply for evidence preservation through court or other authorities to uh, preserve the evidence. Um, but the effect of such evidence preservation cannot be guaranteed. Uh, the Chinese court will also request a plaintiff to provide the clues to the availability of the evidence. For example, uh, if the plaintiff, as a patentee, would like to, uh, the, to apply for the preservation of the sales records of the infringer, the Chinese court will also ask the plaintiff to tell them the whereabouts of the sales uh, records. Of course, the plaintiff would not be able, usually would not be able to provide very details about the whereabouts, but at least it has to provide some clues. For example, uh, the plaintiff would have to answer that the sales record is very likely to be preserved or stored in a computer which is in a certain office place of the defendant. Um, so uh, as, a, a, as a takeaway advice, as I just mentioned here, it, it, so it is quite advisable to uh, ride on a governmental authority for the evidence collection work 
which is not so easy in China uh, because of the absence of the discovery mechanism. And as for the governmental authority, um, I just want to uh, remind all the attendees here that under Chinese law, you can enforce the patent not only through the court, but also through a administrative authority. Um, that is quite also a quite unique feature of the Chinese patent law, which is called the administrative enforcement of the patent right. Uh, the administrative authorities usually will um, not award any damages to the patentee, uh, but somehow it can be used as a, a tool, as you may call it probably a tool, uh, for the patentee to collect the evidence. Uh, that's because the governmental authorities may have the power to investigate into the infringing activities of the accused infringer. And it can also take notes as well as preserve the evidence uh, at the infringer's office. And so the plaintiff can uh, file the administrative enforcement in parallel with the civil litigation and try to use the evidence that will be collected by the administrative authorities also as the evidence in the civil litigation. Um, the next step that the patentee would have to consider is uh, the validity test. Just as Gary uh, mentioned that it's a, always an important feature uh, that the patentee has to uh, consider before, before uh, filing any infringement lawsuit. And according to the Chinese law, the validity test is a must for uh, initiating any design or utility model patent. Those two kinds of patents are also quite unique in China. Uh, you can regard uh, them as some petty patents because uh, they are subject to a shorter time period for the protection. They're only protected for 10 years, while the invention patents are protected for 20 years. And it's also quite easy to uh, obtain a design or a utility model patent because uh, the uh, application process does not have to go through any substantive review process before such a patent can be granted. So as you may imagine, that's why the Chinese courts also request the validity test to be a must before filing such a lawsuit because such a design or utility model patent has not gone through the substantive review. The courts will request the patentee to voluntarily run a validity test and submit a test report to show that the patent has the novelty as well as the inventive staff before they can file the lawsuit. Otherwise, uh, it is likely that the Chinese court will just dismiss the case filing or suspend the case proceeding uh, and uh, until uh, a, a invalidation proceeding for the patent is decided. Uh, and of course, the validity test is not a must for an invention patent, but it's also highly advisable because it is always better to plan in advance before any moving forward. Uh, as a patentee, you don't expect or you don't like to see the scenario that your patent will be invalidated before, uh, after you file the lawsuit. Of course, you like to know uh, before the litigation whether the patent will be sustained or not should a invalidation proceeding is to be initiated by the defendant. And uh, as you may note, China, unlike the US, uh, we follow a uh, bifurcated patent system, which means uh, the validity test of the patent as well as the infringement lawsuit will have to be dealt with by two separate authorities. While the infringement lawsuit will be filed at a civil litigation court, um, the invalidation proceeding will have to be filed in Beijing before the Patent Reexamination Board, which is affiliated to uh, the China's uh, State Intellectual Property Administration. So that's a governmental authority, an administrative authority to decide over the validity issue. Um, and as China follows the standards of global novelty and inventiveness, we think it is always advisable to try to team up with patent attorneys across the globe to cover the main IP offices 
when you are doing the uh, validity search or the prior art search. Our experience shows that uh, sometimes you can dig up some very surprised results if you can uh, look into some IP uh, portfolios which are available in some other jurisdictions. For example, uh, a particular example is Japan. Um, sometimes um, if you don't know the Japanese language, you probably will omit or neglect the search of the Japanese patent office. But usually you can find some really valuable prior art references uh, in the JPO uh, patent portfolio. So it's always advisable to probably team up with the different teams in different jurisdictions. Um, the next topic is the infringement claim chart. Uh, I think it's quite a, a straightforward document. Um, so in anticipation of the investigation, uh, it's always advisable to allege infringement in the claim chart for as many as claims as possible. Uh, that may be a little bit different from the practice in some other jurisdictions, but in China, uh, you can try to argue that in the, in the claim chart that as many uh, claims have been, uh, have been infringed by the defendant. And you still have the uh, possibility and the procedure right to change and amend your claim chart uh, during the litigation proceeding. Uh, and uh, since you will have the second chance to supplement, it's not necessary to go into all details in the claim chart. You can just say, we think the features uh, of the uh, claims can all read on the accused infringement product. So it is also okay to mark infringement on the doctrine of equivalence as literal infringement in the claim chart uh, before or at a time of the case filing, uh, which means you still have the chance of revising that and amending your argument. Uh, during the litigation proceeding. And the takeaway advice here is uh, when you are preparing the claim charts, uh, usually you have to disassemble the infringing product. And for the disassembly of the infringing product, it is also advisable to engage a notary public, as I just mentioned, to <coughs> notarize the entire process. And the last legal document that the patentee has to prepare before the filing lawsuit is the civil complaint or the pleading. Um, under the Chinese law and the practice, usually the pleading could be a very uh, succinct and simple uh, legal document, which is merely a couple of pages. So um, it's not so uh, difficult for a patentee uh, to meet the legal requirements for the uh, pleading under the Chinese law. Uh, we don't have the um, very strict rules uh, for the facts or for uh, the reasonings or the formats that you have to uh, must that you must follow uh, for preparing the uh, civil complaint. The key issue is that you will have a uh, clear indication of the plaintiff and a clear indication of the defendant, as well as the clear prayer for relief such as whether you're going to claim for an injunction or you're going to claim for an injunction plus monetary damages. So usually uh, the complaint can be a very simple document. And the takeaway advice here is some courts in China may request a legal representative. As you may remember, we talked about how a legal representative can be decided for a U.S. company or for some other uh, foreign companies. And some courts will request the legal representative of the plaintiff to hand sign the civil complaint. There might be an inconvenience for uh, some foreign uh, corporations if they don't understand Chinese, but I just want to let you know uh, that's a practice that has been followed by some Chinese courts. So uh, sometimes you will have to do that. Okay, I think that's the end of my presentation. I thank you again for your precious time in joining us. And I will just hand the time to my colleague, fellow partner, Dr. Zhang Hu. Oh, thank you, Hans. I'm sorry that uh, uh, my topic here is a determination of damages in patent litigation in China. Uh, almost, I, I would like to cover three aspects. The first one is uh, we have several methods to determine damages. 
as you may know, there are three, mainly there are three ways to calculate the damages. The first one is the um, actual losses of good guy. And second, and the second is the legal profits of bad guy. Uh, but there, in, there is an alternative way to calculate it. For example, uh, multiples of license fees of royalty. It, it, it's an alternative way to calculate actual losses of a patentee. And we may also mention reasonable expenses. Uh, reasonable expenses can be calculated uh, in addition to uh, damages. And if we cannot have a uh, very accurate amount of uh, actual losses or illegal profits, uh, we may find that in most cases, statutory damages are applied. In some cases, we'll have uh, 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 stipulated damages. Uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, patentee or the uh, uh, infringer they may have an, an agreement uh, to calculate the damages, that is, which is called stipulated damages. All, all these are the, the ways to calculate uh, damages uh, as an overview. But I'd like to give some tips of the uh, of some of them. For example, illegal profits of infringer. According to judicial interpretation, the interests gained from the infringement by an infringer shall be limited to the in interests gained from patent infringement, while interests generated from other rights shall be reasonably deducted. So there is a concept, we call it contribution rate. For example, in, when a, a product infringing upon an invention or utility patent is a component of another product, the damages shall be reasonably determined by the court considering the value of a component itself, its contribution to the profit of another pr product, etc. And uh, uh, when we talk about the reasonable expenses, um, according to patent law in China, the damages shall include the reasonable expenses that the patentee has paid for stopping any infringement. But according to judicial interpretation, the uh, reasonable expenses uh, can be calculated separately and uh, is not included in the damages. So it, it, it can be um, damages in addition to the uh, pure uh, economic damages. And um, uh, the, a recent opinion issued by the Supreme Court uh, says that where a right owner claims for costs for stopping infringement as uh, additional reasonable expenses in the second instance, an appellate court should take them into consideration. Uh, let's see. Uh, this, the second part is um, legislation trend to strengthen punishment. Now we have a civil code. It will be effective in 2021. In, in Article 1185, uh, uh, it says the infringed party may claim punitive damages when an infringement upon intellectual property is conducted on purpose and the circumstances of the infringement are serious. So there are two tests are met if we want to uh, apply punitive damages. One is willful infringement, and the other is serious circumstances. And we have our patent law uh, under the uh, proceeding of amendment, according to the legislation plan for the year of two, uh, 2020, uh, the patent law will be amended. 
and uh, the multiple of uh, royalty will range from one time to five times, and the statutory damages will be up to five million yuan. It, it, it is raised to five million yuan. Uh, so the third part is uh, procedure mechanisms to prove damages. Uh, we have some uh, procedure mechanisms to uh, uh, prove our damages. First one is a recent opinion uh, issued by the Supreme Court. Uh, according to paragraph 12, um, uh, the Supreme Court tried to increase uh, effectively the amount of the damages so there are some ways to um, prove the uh, amount of damages. For example, the first one is government records. We may find some tax records or financial reports. Second, infringers' uh, records, financial data showed in their financial reports or on their websites or on an e-commerce platform. Third, industrial data. For example, we may find some industrial average profits. Yes, that's to improve our losses or their illegal um, profits. And there is a new mechanism. Mechanism is, is called uh, evidence submission order. Uh, according to a judicial interpretation uh, in 2005, uh, well, uh, it, in uh, Rule 112, it says uh, where the documentary evidence is under the control of the opposing party, the party who bears the burden of proof may submit a written application requesting a court to order the opposing party to submit it before the expiry of the time limit for presenting evidence. And now you may see in the slides that uh, um, in 2020, there, there is a new uh, judicial interpretation. In this uh, interpretation, rule uh, 45 to 48, uh, we may see that uh, uh, if you want to uh, apply for an evidence submission order, you have to identify what evidence you want to, the, the opposing party to produce. And you may uh, have to explain to the court that the evidence is really controlled by the accusing, uh, accused infringers. And you have to persuade the court that uh, there is a need and importance of the fact to be proven. If uh, all of the things that you have done, then the court may issue an evidence submission order. When the order is issued and the opposing party refused to present such evidence, then the dispute, uh, dispute effects uh, uh, seems to be proved, proven. Yeah. Okay, I uh, go through my uh, slides very quickly because uh, I don't want to uh, delay the, this webinar so long. Thank you.